My name is Deirdre Byrne, and I'm here for Montgomery Community Media. I have the Attorney General, Brian Frosch, here today. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about was the uh, upcoming election. Um, it's going to be different, obviously, than any election that we've seen before because of the coronavirus. There's a lot more people that are voting by mail, by drop boxes. Um, but with that in mind, um, President Trump, at, at the last debate specifically, has been sowing fear about the election. Um, and at the last debate, he encouraged his supporters to go to the polls as poll watchers. And so I just wanted to ask you what your reaction to that was and, and about what is a poll watcher and what is the difference between a poll watcher and voter intimidation? First, Deidre, thank you very much for having me. And it's a great question. It's, uh, it's not nearly as simple as President Trump would lead you to believe. First of all, voter intimidation, voter harassment is a crime. It's a crime under state law. It's a crime under federal law. So if people are intending in Maryland to come to the polls and try to intimidate or harass voters, they will meet with prosecution. We will not allow that to happen. Um, second, uh, everybody has to abide by the COVID-19 social distancing guidelines and mask guidelines. So if you are, if you are planning to go to the polls to watch voters or whatever, you have to say, you have to stay at least six feet away from them. You must wear a mask. Uh, and voters, when you're going into the poll, you need to be socially distant as well. And the, the places will be marked if you're lining up to, to vote either early or on election day. And uh, you should have uh, a mask on just to make sure that you don't get infected or that anybody else uh, doesn't get infected by you. Um, so within that framework, Deidre, uh, it is possible to be a poll watcher, but poll watchers must be designated by a candidate or the party and only a handful can be inside the polling place at any one time. And while they're there, their function is, is very limited. They, they may challenge the identity of a voter, but they have to sign a form under penalty of perjury saying, that, Brian, that guy who says he's Brian Frosch, that's not Brian Frosch. Um, and so you better be right if you're challenging the uh, identity of a potential voter. And uh, they can't talk to the voters inside the polls. They can't try to persuade them to vote one way or another inside the polls. That's prohibited within 100 feet of the polling places. So that's, that's the basic outline of what poll watchers can do and can't do. Have you been working with local jurisdictions about, have, have you been worried about voter intimidation and have you been working with the local jurisdictions about how to possibly address this if it was to occur? Yes. Um, our office works with the State Board of Elections and the State Board of Elections is giving guidance to all of the uh, local boards. Uh, we so we are working through the State Board of Elections with all the local boards. We, we answer questions from the local boards on occasion when they have them, um, but we are making sure and we'll be releasing guidelines uh, within a very short period of time for everyone, not just the, the State Board and the local boards. We think they know what's going on, but just so that everyone who's heard the president say, uh, I want you to go to the polls and watch, or I want you to go to the polls and try to persuade people uh, to vote for me. We, we want everyone to understand what the rules are, what, what you can do, what you can't do. Uh, and uh, we hope to have a nonviolent civil election uh, starting from October 26th, when early voting begins, and running through November 3rd, uh, the election day. 
Um, he's the president has also um, talked a lot about voter fraud and in the past, you know, there's been very little evidence of voter fraud in, in big presidential elections. Um, but but there is um, this election, it is going to be a lot of people voting by mail. Do, are you concerned about voter fraud and should Marylanders be concerned about this issue? Deirdre, we're, we're always concerned about voter fraud, but it's almost non-existent. Uh, there, I mean, I read in the paper this morning that in California, the Republican Party was setting up these drop boxes that are illegal uh, and encouraging people to put their ballots in those drop boxes. That's voter fraud. But generally, what, what goes on is that uh, out of a million voters, maybe one person will do something that's wrong. And sometimes it's not fraud. Sometimes it's a, a genuine mistake. Somebody uh, gets an absentee ballot, fills it out, sends it in, gets confused, think they still need to vote on election day. And that's wrong. It's illegal. But it's not fraud uh, most of the time. Uh, and, and we try to make sure that those votes don't get counted. We're very good at that. The, the boards of elections are, are very good at, at um, stopping that. They know when somebody's received a mail ballot and uh, when they show up to vote, sometimes they'll say, well, okay, you can vote provisionally, but if your absentee ballot, mail ballot shows up, we're not counting the provisional vote. Um, but the instances of voter fraud in Maryland are very, very rare. And, um, you know, we're pretty good at rooting them out. Are you aware of any instances that have happened since people have started voting by mail or dropping off their ballots? Or are you aware of any instances of voter intimidation in, in Maryland that has happened so far? I, I don't think we've had reports of voter intimidation. It's hard to uh, intimidate somebody who's voting from the privacy of their house. Um, and I've not heard of anybody uh, stopping people on their way to the drop boxes that are set up to, to take the uh, mail ballots. Um, but, you know, I see videos online in Maryland of people saying hateful things. I mean, I saw two yesterday of racist, hateful acts that people have engaged in our, in our state. It makes me angry and sad at the same time. And if something like that occurs at a poll, that may well be voter harassment, voter intimidation, and we'll take steps to prosecute folks who do that. For a, for a regular person going to the poll, if they see something they think could be voter harassment, who do they report something like that to? They can call the police. They can call their local state's attorney. They can call our office. Um, and uh, they can also call the Board of Elections. But law enforcement, I think, is going, I mean, unless it's just a, a, an administrative hassle at the polls, the lines are too long, voting machines broken, something like that. If it's actual voter intimidation or voter harassment, they should call law enforcement. And I know in August that Maryland was one of the states that had, that um, filed a lawsuit against the United States Post Office. Is has there been any problems since then with the Post Office, um, especially with the election right around the corner? Um, or there is there any updates with that case that we should be aware of? Well, uh, Deidre, we we won that case. Uh, the judge in our case enjoined the Postal Service from uh, the activities it was engaged in at the time. They were telling mail carriers, if the mail isn't ready, just leave, go on your rounds. Uh, they were taking out of service the sorting machines that count, that, that sort tens of thousands of envelopes of mail in an hour. Um, 
and uh, they were refusing to pay overtime. And they had a dramatic impact on mail delivery in Maryland and throughout the country. Baltimore still has uh, poor mail delivery. It has not recovered from what uh, was what was going on earlier this summer. And I'm assuming that one of the reasons is that several of the mail sorters in Baltimore and, and close to Baltimore were taken out of service. And in, in, in some cases, and although I'm not sure about these specifically, the, the postal service was trashing them. They were leaving them out in the rain. They were putting them in dumpsters. Uh, they essentially took these vital counting or sorting machines and threw them away. The judge ordered them to replace them. They said, in some cases, oh, we can't because we trashed them. And the judge said, I don't care. Get sorting machines, put them back in there, get them working before the election. We're still suffering from um, that in areas of Maryland, Baltimore being one. And we are hopeful that the Postal Service will abide by the judge's orders and get their service back to where it was. It's not the mail carrier's fault, it's the leader's fault. And uh, we want to see it up running as smoothly as it was and has been for years. Um, during this election period. Um, kind of shifting to a, on, a, on a different note, um, last week you and Governor Hogan announced um, $11.7 million um, in funding, which would provide legal services to residents that were facing eviction. Could you tell me a little bit about, about that announcement? Yes. Um, so uh, we were very glad to be able to cooperate with the governor on this. Our office had uh, won a settlement from the, the residential mortgage-backed uh, securities uh, issue that uh, plagued us during the financial crisis that began in 2008. And we had $8.7 million that uh, was to be distributed for housing-related purposes in, in our state. And uh, we wrote to the governor and said, look, legal services in a crisis, legal aid and, and various other um, legal services for people who don't have means, uh, they've essentially lost all their funding. Their funding comes from fees on, on court uh, filings and from interest on lawyers' trust accounts. Well, there's no interest anymore. I mean, we're basically down to where banks pay zero or just a tiny amount on, in, in interest on accounts. And uh, court filings had plummeted. So they were out of money. They, they are out of money. And uh, they were, I think, really fearful that they may have to shut down, start laying people off and shut down right at the time when we're looking at a, a huge increase in eviction filings in our state. So the governor was able to take $3 million from general funds. We had $8.7 million in uh, this settlement and a total of 11.7 million will be used to keep legal services available uh, to people who are facing the loss of their homes and, and facing other very serious legal consequences, um, but they, they can't afford lawyers to represent them. So uh, this is, I think, a, a big win for uh, everybody who is facing financial difficulties as a result of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Yeah. Do you have, when it comes to this upcoming election, um, do you have any, uh, what, what would you consider your biggest concern when it comes to the November election and the early voting around it? Well, I don't want to see the election disrupted in any way. I don't want to see it disrupted physically by people who are trying to intimidate or harass voters. And then I don't, I don't want, uh, the election to be thrown into the courts. Uh, the mail-in ballots can be counted properly and will be counted properly in our state. 
And I believe the same is true of other states as well. And uh, this is not something that uh, should be a major crisis, but Donald Trump is giving signals and the Republican National Committee giving signals, they're gonna challenge every single uh, vote, every single precinct in areas where they expect uh, Democrats to be voting and in states that they think are swing states. And that troubles me a great deal. We're gonna do everything we can in Maryland to make sure that every vote counts and that people are treated fairly and that the election is held in a normal way uh, and in accordance with the law. I don't think we're gonna have a problem in Maryland. Uh, but I do think uh, that you're going to see problems in other states throughout the country. I guess my last question is, do you have a message to voters um, who are voting, whether it's by mail, by, by going in person, or dropping it off at a drop box? Yeah, thank you for that opportunity, Deidre. I sure do. And my message is, make a plan and vote. You can still register until eight o'clock today um, before the election. You can also register at the polls on election day. You can show up on November 3rd, register and vote. But today is the last day to register in advance. You can do it online. Um, and um, I would encourage everybody to make a plan. If, you're, if you want to vote on election day, make a plan, figure out the best time for you and show up and vote. You still have the opportunity to, to request and mail in a ballot. Uh, and if you're going to do that, I would suggest that you do it as fast as you can. Uh, mail it as long before election day as you possibly can. If you've got your ballot now, uh, um, fill it out. You can drop it off at a drop box. Um, it's really very easy and you can, uh, or you can put it in the mail. It's postage prepaid. So all you gotta do is take it to a mailbox and put it in. There is also the opportunity to vote in person before election day, starting on October 26th. So there are lots of opportunities for people who wanna vote. Make a plan and do it, do it early if you can.